Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Brian Underhill. I will tell you all about Brian in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that deals with what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment that we uh, exert toward others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will definitely find out that Brian is, you do it with a singular purpose of bringing people together for common cause. Welcome, Brian Underhill. So, Thank you. Great to be Great. here. Thanks for having me. I want to tell people about you. Brian, uh, PhD, Dr. Uh, Brian Underhill is the founder and CEO of Coach Source, which is the world's largest executive coaching firm with over 1,100 coaches worldwide. And he's a co-editor of a brand, brand new book that we're going to talk about today called Coach Me your personal board of directors, as well as Mastering Executive Coaching, the author of Executive Coaching, and many other things. He's also a, a relentless contributor. He is a much sought after speaker and a very, very good one. He's spoken globally, and I've heard him many, many times. He was nominated as a Thinker's 50 leading global coach in 2019. Uh, as I mentioned, he has a, a PhD in organizational psycho psychology, and he resides in Silicon Valley, California. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, so. John. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, you and I have known each other for quite some time. Um, and um, so tell us about the new book, Coach Me. Show it to us, too, okay. please. <laughs> <laughs> it just came out, actually, at the beginning of the month here in May. Coach Great. Me, your personal board of directors. Leadership Great. advice from the world's greatest coaches. Great. So um, what led you to, this is not your first book. You have a wonderful book, on the, which I think is the uh, a Bible of executive coaching, the ins and outs, and I have it on my shelf. So what led you to write Coach Me? <laughs> Create it. Well, Coach Me is actually very different than all the coaching books you see. Now, most coaching books out there are aimed at coaches, all of us. Uh, learning how to be a coach and be a better coach. This is actually aimed at anyone who's in a leadership role. Um, and, and honestly, anyone out there who's who's a leader of any way, shape, or form. You don't even have to have a title leader, but you might be a de facto leader. Um, it's aimed at helping you as a leader figure out how to improve in various areas using the advice of 52 top coaches in the world, uh, each one having a chapter, actually 50 chapters. Great. Well, I want to thank you, Brian, for um, undercutting my source of livelihood. Thank you. Just people just have to read a book and uh, they don't need us. So uh, on behalf of the coaches of the world, Brian, I say thank you. So, <laughs> so, so tell us some of the contributors who um, uh, are in the book, because it's quite prestigious. So. Well, uh, you mentioned the Thinkers 50 organization a little bit ago, and um, they actually in 2019 did the first ever nomination of the top coaches in the world. Uh, thinkers 50 usually does like the top 50 thinkers in this and that topic and so forth. Um, and so they decided to do it for coaches uh, for the first time. They actually named 80, not 50, but uh, 80 top coaches. Uh, I was fortunate to be named one of them. Um, and from those 80, we actually were able to have 50 to write chapters for us. And it's a lot of names. I mean, depending on how well connected folks are here to, to executive coaches, you have uh, names like, you know, uh, David Peterson or, or Mark Thompson or Alyssa Cohn, who heads up, who, who's famous for um, startup coaching, yeah. um, coaches from around the world, by the way. Um, so we didn't uh, just limit it to, say, North America or, or the UK, something like that. That's wonderful. No, I like the global span of that because your business, Coach Source, is global, too. So there, we're going to touch on that in just a minute. But um, so since this book is designed to uh, rob coaches of their livelihood, why don't you tell us some of the, <laughs> some of the cases you like in the book, Brian? <laughs> Yeah, and it's was, it was great. So every chapter, uh, the coach actually has to start with a story of someone they were coaching. Um, so for the rest of us, we can bite in really easily and understand, uh, maybe see if it relates to us. And, and we have some pretty fa fantastic stories. So we, uh, we have a couple of stories where people who got promoted, um, who were like always so great at what they did, and they get promoted into the next role, and things are going really badly once they get promoted. We have a couple of stories of people who 
And, uh, you know, and I'm, Brian, I'm glad you so, uh, highlighted that kind of thing, because so often I think every senior executive I've ever worked with had that moment where he or she was going along really smoothly and everything was going. And then they got that next role or whatever. And then I go, whoa, you're going sideways. So it's not a, so it's put it by putting it in the book. You make it uh, more universal. That's kudos to you guys for doing that. So. So. Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, some of the pitfalls that leaders encounter, are, you'll see in here in different stories. Uh, again, like the promotion situation or uh, we actually have a leader in here who's a uh, video production company uh, at COVID in China. So his business completely disappeared. And so you can see what how he was able to pivot and with the help of a coach. Um, every one of these, of course, is working with a coach. So you get to learn yeah. what the coach is doing to help them change their situation and and improve in various leadership areas right and you know i was i have been teasing you about uh, taking <laughs> the livelihood of <laughs> our coaches but actually it doesn't i believe it, it very much complements it and i think you know the more informed a quote our consumers or executives are about the coaching process it it makes i think it opens the door for us as coaches would you agree with that so, Brian. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's very common, actually, a, a, as a newer field where executives who hire a coach don't have a quite of a good understanding of what coaching is and what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, and what, that was actually another inspiration for a book like this is to be able to share with anyone who's considering working with a coach. Here's some of the ways you can benefit from a coach. Um, and help them understand. In fact, we'll probably, my company will probably reprint certain key chapters just to hand to new leaders who are starting coaching with us to help them see what kinds of things you can do with a coach. And, and honestly, what are some things you probably aren't going to be receiving from an executive coach? Okay. We, uh, we have a, a, a question from a longtime viewer and listener, uh, Joe, who, who's my faithful listener and I thank him. So, um, is there a takeaway from coaching that um, you see from your vantage point, at, either as an author or as the head of CEO? What are, what are, I guess, what are the top issues that organizations are looking for to improve in their executives? Yeah. Well, uh, as we've talked about transition a little bit ago, and that is definitely one of the top reasons um, why someone would hire a coach, because you transition into a new role or into a new company, and that can be very fraught with danger if not handled correctly. Uh, we also find, interestingly enough, companies ask for improved executive presence, this nebulous <laughs> term, you know, someone who looks and smells and sounds like an executive and somehow this person isn't that right now. Uh, and so a coach gets hired to help them be more executive like, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, well, that's that's it'll stop on that one, because yeah. I think that's a that's one that I often been called in. And I always switch it to it's not just executive presence is the accepted term, but I'd like to call it leadership presence, yeah. which gets us a little bit deeper, which gets into your authenticity. And so um, and that's it's always good. And I'm glad that because you have I think that secret of your presence is giving people a reason to believe in you. Would you not agree with that, uh, Brian? So. Yeah, and, it, and it can, as you know well, it, it could be many factors, some of which a bit intangible as to what this exactly means. Uh, gravitas, it could be how well you speak, how well you write, even what you wear. Um, uh, all kinds of different factors can go into what people might consider executive presence. Sometimes. Right. It's kind of an amorphous. And I, I like the way you just said, it because I, I've heard it pitched to me this way is like, Brian is, is got it. He's everything's there except one thing. And I go, well, what is it? And they go, well, I don't, I presence. Yeah, that's it. So it's undefined. And so often, so let's yeah. shift now in, into our pandemic world, which, we have heard something that was sadly turned into a buzz term, buzzword, I think, but is important for us to remember is empathy. Can we coach empathy, Brian? Mm. Oh, yeah, I would think so. Um, you know, how a leader now, very often we're coaching what you see out of a leader behaviors, right? Um, and of course, we're trying to dig inside that to some extent as coaches. We're not necessarily psychologists uh, doing therapy at all, but we're digging inside yeah. that and how does it manifest in behaviors. And you absolutely can um, improve a leader's ability to be more empathetic. Now, assuming they would like to be more empathetic and it's, it's not right. just pretend, which people can see right through. 
Do you, would you think that there might be, well, prior to our pandemic, but even maybe today, that some people would be have the capacity for empathy, as a matter of fact, they demonstrate it in their personal lives, but might have been reluctant to do it in a work situation? So, Yeah, that's an interesting question, because there is always this separation between how we behave at work and how we behave at home. And I think the pandemic has blurred that a lot. I think we would all agree. Um, we've probably hopefully become a little more empathetic uh, to people's situations and we're seeing their homes, right. seeing inside their homes and we're seeing their cat walk across the keyboard and the kids running in from outside or whatnot. It kind of humanizes us a little bit more in, right. in this pandemic, and I think pandemic world. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. But I think part of that was a, might be a reluctance of if I'm being empathetic or I'm demonstrating care, I'm prying. Would you think that at all? Do you, or um, what would you? Maybe. I have someone on my staff where I had the exact same sensation. Something is really bothering this person. And I, I don't know what it is. And it's odd for them. And I needed to know more, but I didn't want to pry. And I had this very yeah. debate with myself. And I decided to go ahead and inquire, and but allow space for them not to discuss it if they didn't yeah. want to. Right. Uh, well, know. one one of the things I take in it about empathy is that ability to feel another one's discomfort, pain, suffering. But I think from a leadership standpoint, what we need to demonstrate, and I believe this can be taught, is the idea of compassion. Compassion is the expression of um, of, of empathy. And it's what you just did. And you sensed your empathy was sensing the pain of your a colleague, but then here's what I'm going to do. So mm -hmm. you acted with compassion. So, mm -hmm. um, that's great. So, I mean, now we are in, in getting back to the book, cause I want you to folks to be familiar with it. Is there, um, a, uni a couple of universal, you talk about presence and things like that. Other universals that come through in the book, you talked about transitions and mm -hmm. like any, any other themes that pop up. Uh, there's, there's a few about uh, sharing a vision, or, you know, creating and sharing a vision in a way that's inspiring to others. Mm -hmm. And I think during a world like now, that's always going to be very critical to help people give a sense of hope of where we're going uh, as an organization and, and to be able to buy into that. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a number of stories in the communication area of executives, leaders that need to be better communicators. Um, there's a lot of stories about relationships and building better relationships with folks. Um, empathy is probably part of that yeah. as well. Right. We have some intercultural stories. We have, many of us are working in organizations that span borders. And uh, so we have some coaches that help leaders with the interesting dynamics of certain cultures working with each other that, that can be mm -hmm. very different in how they express something, for example. And that, uh, let's, let's, let's pause on that for a minute. So it's basically that and when one is coaching in a, well, leading in a global organization, um, could we say that one size does not fit all? We have to temper our style toward the culture in which we're leading. I don't mean to be too obvious, but is that true or is it, what's your perspective, Brian? Yeah. What, and of course, if you're referring to culture as the culture of the organization or the culture of the country, uh, both of those are applicable, by the way. Yeah. You know, so right. you might have a pretty soft, gentle, nice organization and you're coming in new and you're you know, beating things up and smashing things and so on that just that's going to backfire. And yeah. they always say culture eats strategy for lunch and it eats pretty much anything for lunch. Right? So, <laughs> um, if you're a leader and, and uh, you know, unless all the leaders are behaving a certain way, you're, you're probably not going to survive. Uh, the, well, take you out. the thing about culture and then you do, I always say when folks mention it, I go, whether you know it or not, you have a culture. It may not be what you want, but it's there. And it's just, you know, so and I think that sensitivity needs to be there. And that's where the coach fits in. And it's good that you have people from different perspectives and different ways of doing it. So um, talk about the communication aspect of it, because almost that seems almost so obvious that it's not. Do you find that, Brian? It is so obvious that it's not. I mean, it, it is. <laughs> Since I remember since my very, I've been in the field 25 plus years and interviewing leaders at the very big, oh, we need to communicate better. I think that's what we all need to do is communicate better. And, and uh, that's still true, you know, even now. But of course, right. it's got a lot more complexities to it than that. But 
very vital, of course, for a scene. Right. And, and, and I, th I think what it is, is it, it's less the articulation of a message, but more of the listening for feedback. And am, am I, what is that your perspective, Brian? So they do say, you know, it does, you know, we, we're, Many of us are working in organizations more with knowledge workers than with people who are, you know, running a factory or something. Uh, it's more common in, in, say, in the States. And knowledge workers are using their brains and you want them to use their brains at work. Um, and so they're not going to behave as well if, if you're just pushing them around and telling them how everything should be done. You as the leader don't know everything anymore very often. You actually don't even know how to do everything. You have to use those <laughs> knowledge workers to their best ability. I don't know how to do anything. That's why I became a coach. Uh, so <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> so I'm being honest, Brian. Uh, so, uh, and, and there's one thing about, I think that part of the communication is, I just did a short piece on it and a very kind of a nuts and bolts piece, but closing the loop. You know, so often when we coalesce around a discussion or excuse me, a major decision or whatever, and I ask for input or the leader asks for input, then it's implemented, but there's never any follow through. So have you encountered that? So, well, that's just to say, is that the, one of the sayings, you know, sometimes half of life is just showing up or something like that is, um, yeah. yeah, closing the loop is such a simple, basic thing that we should do as leaders to see that we're being reliable and we're doing what we say we would do. Um, it, you know, it, I remember having an employee really grouchy about something because there was interpersonal conflict. So I dug in, learned more and I said, okay, I'll follow up with the other person you had conflict with. I'll come back to you. Um, I delegated the follow up. So someone else did that follow up. We never closed the loop back to the original person. And about three months later, we're trying to figure out why the original person is so grouchy all the time. And it turned out she thought we did nothing about her concern <laughs> when we did, but we never yeah. followed up and told her about it. Just such a absolutely. simple, basic thing. Absolutely. And I think that's a powerful lesson. And it, I think it's because I don't think it's intentional as much, but we get tied up in doing things we just kind of forget. So, again, obvious, exactly. but so obvious we don't do it. So, OK, um, uh, Brian, many of the readers of this book, which are. Of pot I'm going to say potential coaching clients um, will be struggling with the idea of the great resignation, moving on to different jobs. So um, can what can coaching do to, with executives who are facing retention issues? So, Oh, such a fantastic question. We've been studying this deeply in an as an industry, I think. Um, you have a couple of things. For one, um, I saw some more recent research that suggested that Toxic work culture is really the, the largest predictor of departure. Um, by the way, it's not money. Uh, most companies, including mine even, we throw more money at people. The uh, interest rates are, are, sorry, the inflation is high, whatnot. Yeah. Let's throw money at it. They're going to make yeah. money, more money elsewhere. Give them more money. That's certainly useful, but it's actually not one of the top predictors for why someone's going to leave. It's actually the same reasons they've often been. My manager's a jerk, toxic culture. I'm not getting opportunities to, to um, contribute the way I'd like. Uh, so it's believed that a lot of the areas why someone would have left three years ago are the same now. It's just they're way more pronounced. And right. so a bad culture has gotten worse um, and people don't want to put up with it. And there's you know, two right. jobs open for every job seeker. I can get another job somewhere. I can even take some time off if I want, and I'm going to do that. I'm not going to play yeah. with this anymore. And, you know, I mean, uh, to me, I mean, uh, obviously I, I am not an employer, but I, th I view the great resignation as the great liberation for employees to choose part of their own destiny, uh, yeah. which they should anyway. And so what, just what you said, I gave them an option. So um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. So let's say you're coaching me and I have got, you know, three key people whom I need to retain. And what, what advice would you give to me? Uh, Brian, so well, if you're trying to retain them, I mean, we probably need to know more about the situation and um, how are you seen as a leader and uh, how well are you able to uh, motivate and inspire and, and be empathetic and all of those things. And by the way, each of your direct reports may need different types of attention, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so we probably have to understand more about each of those things. Having said well, that, um, some people may just leave anyways where there's not much you can do. Maybe they it's time for a new career for them. That's what a lot of people are deciding. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to 
leave and start my own business. Uh, the new business starts are way up uh, lately. So people are saying this is, I don't want to work for someone else. I want to do my own thing. And right. to some extent, you may not necessarily be able to prevent that, but maybe you can bless them and wish them well as they go do it. No, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad you delineated that because I've had these conversations with just what you said. Um, and it's some like, you know, hey, uh, I have this conversation with you. We want you to stay. We see an opportunity for you. But, you know, if you a if somebody's doubling your salary or this is a passion you want to pursue, who am I? Who, uh, let's not stand in the way. So. Yeah, I, I was coaching someone recently. And by the way, coaching can do this. So it's a little warning to folks. If someone's thinking about leaving and they have a coach, um, it's possible they're going to decide to leave a lot faster than you thought. Um, and that's not because of us as coaches telling them to leave. We almost never will do that. Um, all we're doing is helping them analyze through their thinking process and what's important to them. And very often it starts to become more obvious through coaching that leaving might be the best thing. So I had a leader leave a top executive position with no other job and no plans to go back to work for about two years because he wants to spend, really does want to spend time with his aging parents and his son is only a few more years at home. Um, and he is not even remotely concerned about where he'll find his next job. He has money saved. Uh, it was a huge shock to his company. Actually surprised me too. But that's what the great resignation has done. People have reprioritized what's important to them. No, and that's great. And, and you, actually, you touched on something that isn't, and, and you know this well, and I know you teach it. I've heard you speak about it. Well, coaching really is, is an avenue for self-awareness. And so when, when we are coaching people, we're bringing, challenging them to think for themselves. I don't mean they haven't, think, they become more self-aware, things they've put aside. So it, it would be, I hadn't, have you thought about it? But of course, if you're, you know, considering where you are and how you fit into the organization and what your runway is, why coaching may stimulate that kind of leaving. So it very well it, can. It, and it, employers uh, have told me they're okay with that, oddly enough, because if the person's going to leave anyways, then maybe we should get ourselves to that space faster and wish them well um, and, and let it go from there. Yeah, I, I, so I'm glad you mentioned that. So uh, because uh, I, I wouldn't want employers listening to this uh, broadcast to think that we are trying to, you know, ruin their lives. No, but, you know, better to know sooner than later. And it's better for all the way around for the organization to prepare and for the individual. And, you know, it, it, it makes for a healthy organization. You Especially in, for senior senior level leaders, they have to be 110 percent committed, and if they're not, they're, they're not giving their all for that organization. So, Absolutely, so true. that's important. So, um, what um, I think we touched on communications, presence, transitions, things like that. Aside from the book, but in coaching, are you seeing any? patterns or much in demand for things or is it what we had already discovered or discussed yeah i think in coaching it's probably a lot of what we've discussed uh, maybe one of the bigger changes obviously our industry was able to switch virtual very easily because a lot of times our industry is all virtual just kind of depends but we used to always do a mix of face-to-face -to -face and virtual as a coach i prefer that um but it's very easy just to go purely virtual as coaches and that's what we were able to do um, you know, if, if I can meet someone in person at least once, I, that would be my preference if I yes. can. Um, I'd rather do that. But if not, we can be all virtual. Right. And so talking about the virtual coaching process, that's one thing. And I'm very familiar. I enjoy the virtual process a, a lot. I'm 100 percent committed to it. But there's for those we are coaching. Um, what about what does it take to become a virtual leader? Not a not an almost mm. leader, but coaching in a virtual environment. So yeah, leading in a virtual environment is, is uh, this is going to be some new challenges, I think, because um, and it'll probably take a lot more purposeful activity on the part of leaders. <laughs> I think you still need those relationships. They're still going to be important. So it may have to be dedicated time with different people, getting to know each other, maybe unstructured or fun time. Um, if there's any way you could still visit in person safely, uh, we're getting closer to that time where we can do that. It's still all about relationships. And I don't envy those people who took a new job during the pandemic 
Yeah, I was thinking of my daughter who took a new job and has barely met anyone. And she just works from home. Uh, every so often we get stuff in the mail. We get swag from her company in the mail. <laughs> you know, they're trying to, and, and they've done some virtual events, but it's just hard to feel connected to a company all virtual. But I would encourage <laughs> leaders and companies to do what they can to Right. To be building and, and those I, relationships. You know, um, I, I've talked a lot on this show with mm -hmm. folks and care, um, Callie um, Williams, oh, excuse me, Callie Williamson, Yost is and uh, talked to her about the, and she says, <clears throat> I just have a new article on about with her on um, Forbes. And she talked about it's, it isn't one size fits all, but we're really moving to, unless it's a five day workplace for something like retail or, you know, uh, healthcare, um, it's that it's going to be a hybrid. And so yeah. picking in is kind of what you alluded to picking your moments of when to come together. So, yeah, the hybrid, uh, is going to be interesting. I, I will tell you that, um, because I was, I just at a conference where they were laughing. How did they decide three days a week? Like, how did they come up with that is just because it's between one and five. Okay. Three days a week, everyone come in. Uh, but that's, you know, man, what if the person you need is not there that particular day? And, and then you will always have the issue of you have five people in the room and one outside the room, uh, or how do you even get the technology to work half the time, you know, where there's not echoing all over the place. And you could see, you could see every single person in the room if you don't have a specially built room to, to do <laughs> hybrid. So I think it's going to be kind of messy in all honesty, the whole hybrid well, thing. Well, I, I we think in some ways life is. Actually, what what folks that I've worked with, what they've done, and many other in the tech sector, um, it's picking designated days, whether it's their scrum for agile or whatever it is, but then people get to meet and mix and then they go off and do their own thing, which is yeah. they're independent. I think the challenge comes for managers who have that and leaders who have that hands-on uh, approach, that's a different dynamic. I think that's what you're getting at, correct, Brian? Yeah, it, it really is. Um, and then there's, oh, you, you can come in one day a week if you want, and but your leader's coming in every day of the week, right? There's, there's, there's that mm -hmm. usual thing. Um, right. Or uh, my brother just quit his job as an executive because they wanted him in three days a week, but yet none of his bosses or anyone that he works with is actually in the office that he goes to. So he's like, you want me to sit in traffic for two hours a day uh, to go to an office that no one else is there that I actually work with just because you want me in three days a week. So yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds like something that our colleague uh, Martin Lindstrom could use if he <clears throat> as an additional chapter for Ministry of yes. Common Sense. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, we could go on and on, um, Brian, but we're coming close to an end. And as you know, I ask every guest a story about um, grace. How, um, what story would you like to share? So, Well, when I saw your, you asked me the question ahead of time, so I knew it was coming about grace. But for me, this one's very easy. I'm a, I'm a practicing Christian. I'm very active in church and so forth. So for us, grace makes a lot of sense to us. Uh, it's the idea that all of us are flawed. You know, we're not perfect. We have things we think, say, or do that are just not even remotely close to perfect at times. And so we rely on the grace of God to make us whole. Uh, and um, so for me, that question is extremely easy. I feel like I understand it and I'm uh, enthused about it because uh, otherwise, you know, uh, we wouldn't remotely catch up, uh, stack up to some of the perfection that God has. <laughs> That's great. We're all, we're, we're all works in progress, some of us more than others. And um, we were noting beforehand that you and I actually matched our uh, haircuts, our, our hair <laughs> our and our glasses before we came on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, whoa, this, we kind of look alike. This is a little creepy. I wonder if I should change or take my glasses off or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Anyway, uh, Brian, how can people um, find you and get the book? So, so I'm at coachsource.com. That's our, our website, brian at coachsource.com. Um, the book is at all the usual, the usual spots. I actually don't even have enough of my own copies yet. I only have about three copies. I'm trying to get them. Uh, it's published by uh, Wiley, a well-known publisher. And of course, you know, it's at Amazon and all the usual places uh, that one could find, expect to find books. Well, great. Well, um, Brian, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And the book is Coach Me, which is a practical guide to coaching oneself and learning more about the whole process. So 
Um, and with that, we're going to go out. So, 